Strange things are afoot at the Circle K. That kid is back on the escalator again. Hand on her. Is my boomstick. Oh! Game over, man. Game over. Welcome to the Bargain Bin. He is your host, Ben Mason. And he is your co-host, Sandro Luketic. And today we're talking 1986's Night of the Creeps. We assume if you're listening to this episode, you have already seen the movie. All right, Sandro. Yes, sir. Thrill me. I <laughs> see what you did there. <laughs> I, I I love the line. It's used repeatedly in the movie. Doesn't need to be. No, but I mean, it gives one of the characters a catchphrase, a little bit of a hook. Yeah, definite, uh, definite character trait. And that's a character I'd like to talk about once we get into it a bit more. Um, sure. I'm not even going to bother asking if you've seen this movie before. Because you I know you I haven't. Come exactly. on. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but I do have to say before we get into it, this movie is undeniably a love letter to horror, sci-fi, and comedy films of yesteryear. Um, it's a, a tribute to B-movies all around, right? What the hell is yesteryear? This movie is already 1986, is it not? If it came out in my lifetime, it's not yesteryear. Oh. <laughs> so it so it made it the made previous, the cutoff by previous, just a few years. <laughs> previous generation. Okay. Sure. <laughs> and I, I really do think that it is accessible enough that it should not be relegated to cult status, which it is currently. But I mean, I'm gonna be honest with you. Not only have I not seen the movie before, I hadn't even heard of this one, man. There's a lot of the ones where you pick, and clearly I haven't seen as haha <laughs> running joke. Sandro doesn't watch movies, ironically. But I've at least heard the title, or I'm like, oh, okay, I, I saw a trailer for that. I remember that it's on this actor's resume. Yeah. This one, nothing. Looked nothing. at the cast list, nothing. <laughs> Not even Tom Atkins. Wow. Not even Tom Atkins. No. Uh, it I'm not, well, we'll talk like director writer later, but same director as monster squad who we, what we covered before. And I think you can see elements of that in this, or this, I don't think I've that. seen that one. Never heard of it. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> but this is a movie for some reason I had never owned before. Okay. And my very first time at the C and E in Toronto, I was hating life. Too many people, too much noise, a lot of shit. I didn't care about. And then I went to this one little corner that was selling movies and I found a director's cut of this on DVD for $3. I was like, man, C&E is great. I love this place. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I watch this movie maybe two, three times a year now. Is, is there a movie that you would not buy if you just saw it for like three bucks? It feels like you're getting anything that, that that's that cheap. Uh, uh, <laughs> the wizard. You you probably already own the wizard. Never, I'll never own the wizard. You In don't fact, own I'll, the wizard. It is my life mission to break every copy of that movie I stumble upon. Oh man! So what you're saying is that was your favorite fan pick ever? Oh, it was great. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> All right. Well, let's let's jump into this one. I guess. Cool. Um, I do have to say, starting into the movie, uh, I really think these are amazing opening credits and music. It just nails that um, fun-loving yet creepy horror comedy vibe. Well, it's got to nail something out of the gate because it ain't special effects. Uh, no. Or, sorry, practical costumes. No. Yeah, okay, so we get <laughs> start off in space. This and is horrible. You see, this is oh, this is practical. What are you talking about? <laughs> this this was maybe the worst introduction to the movie because I saw these aliens and I'm like, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> or what have I gotten you into? But yeah, we start on a spaceship and I have them listed as two butt aliens are chasing a third <laughs> who's running away with a canister containing some sort of experiment. But before they can catch him, the canister is launched into space. What a weird opening because you look at like poster art, the DVD, plot synopsis. Aliens are nowhere. No. And honestly, doesn't fit 
the rest of the movie. Anybody who's watching this, like me, will will wonder, okay, well, what kind of movie is this going to be? Are they going to be trying to retrieve this canister? Are they going to be fighting? No, never. Honestly, you could have just literally had the canister falling from outer space, not from a spaceship, not with any sort of gunfight, not with any aliens, and I would have just accepted it. Okay, this yep. thing came from outer space. And the thing is, well, I should stay, state too that we watched the director's cut of the movie, which has a different ending than the theatrical cut. Um, in the director's cut, this comes back at the end. But in the theatrical cut, since there's no other reference to the aliens, we don't need that scene at all. No. Um, have you heard of a movie called um, Slither? Come on, man. I don't know. It's not that old. It stars Nathan Fillion. is directed by James Gunn. No, I don't know it. Oh, okay. Well, I'm it's surprised about, I don't. I love Nathan Fillion. It's about alien slugs taking over people after they crash land in a meteor. Well, that sounds like a very similar plot. Yeah, had, when have I seen a movie like that before? Right? Had they used <laughs> that plot for this movie? That it just came from like an asteroid or something? Yeah. No, that's what I was saying. Even if just even if it was a canister with them, anything, if it just fell from outer space with no actual attempt to explain or originate it, mm -hmm. I would have just accepted it. Okay, it's a monster from some outer space type, whatever. And, and I right? think this is just Fred Decker trying to like cram more science fiction into this movie. Yeah, that's what it needed. Yeah. I'll say this right now. This movie felt like it was trying to be like three different movies. Yeah, and it kind of sounds like it didn't work for you, but it totally worked for me. Um, I do like how after that we end up uh, in 1959 on Sorority Row, uh, filmed in black and white. Perfect. Music of the time. Great. Um, we get Johnny, who's picking up his date at a sorority house. And I love the little um, news bulletin on the radio like a warning from this newscaster about something, but Johnny just turns the radio off before we get into it. Yeah. He's not concerned about that. No, but it is like, as we discover an escaped patient from a, a mental institution who has killed members of the staff and is armed with an ax fire ax, fire ax and uh, the whole be on the lookout thing. Now this took me back to my childhood to a specific moment that terrified the shit out of me, which really shouldn't have. But um, did you ever watch the old black and white Adams Family show? Come on, man. This is like three times in the first episode. I don't know. I thought you were more cultured, maybe. <laughs> anyway, uh -oh. there's uh, the introduction to Cousin It. You know, yeah, I'm assuming. Okay. I can't like, I'm familiar you... with the Adams Family. I've seen like the movies. I know the characters, but I never watched the old black and white show. You know Cousin It, then? Yes. Okay. That's the introduction to Cousin It on the TV show. Is the a broadcast, like, a special news bulletin about, like, an escaped patient. And I was watching that home alone one day. I was probably, like, seven. And I was terrified. And this is a constant reminder of that fear for me when I was a child. So, right away, I already love this movie. Anyway... Johnny and uh, his girlfriend, Pam, end up at the uh, stereotypical, like, make out lookout. Point. Yeah, make out point. Um, uh, we see the meteor <laughs> come crashing down. Oh, wait, no. First, we see uh, young officer Ray Cameron and his realization that, well, he's trying to warn the kids, like, to, uh, to head home. Get out I think. of here. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But realizes that the girl in the car is his recent ex-girlfriend, Pam. There's that awkward scenario, but the meteor crashes and Johnny and Pam go to investigate. It, it actually almost seems like in that scene that he wasn't even made aware that they had broken up. <laughs> yeah, you're very right. Like, she's uh, just like, yeah, it's over. Don't you know? You're like, no. <laughs> <laughs> you, know you know what would have tipped me off? If you said, hey, it's over. <laughs> uh, it, it's a I'm pretty... Surprised I'm surprised we pinpointed this as a makeout point because there wasn't like big industrial mills behind it. Yeah. Yeah. Once bitten, this isn't. <laughs> uh, Johnny finds the meteor, which is the slug canister. 
which is looks really good, man. That canister where you can just see them all like flipping around inside. It's pretty gross. I mean, anything after that initial alien scene does look pretty good. Yeah. Especially for its time. It's just that uh, bit of an odd decision. That's the best foot forward that you got. Yeah, those aliens are awful. Yeah. Uh, and while uh, while Johnny's investigating the canister, Pam is actually killed by the axe wielding maniac. Um, seems like a weird time to cut the pledge week in '86, but that's exactly what happens. Um, and here we get our intro to uh, Chris Romero, played by Jason Lively, and J.C. Hooper, played by Steve Marshall. Um, did uh, J.C. remind you of anybody? Like, if you were to recast that role. In 86, who would you get? Because it, it jumped out to me immediately. <sighs> no, no idea. Robert Downey Jr. Uh, maybe, I guess. Uh, uh, that means you haven't seen Robert Downey Jr.'s acting in the 80s. I mean, you made me watch some of it. Yeah. Like, you could see him from uh, Tough Turf here, right? <sighs> no. Okay, there's something wrong with you then. No, I, I don't think he was as goofy in tough turf uh okay yeah i'm just trying to think of what i've shown you where he was a, a teen at that time yeah it's not a big deal well chris spots cynthia cronenberg played by jill whitlow from afar and falls in love immediately oh i can't stand that yeah Ugh. it's cringy but so's chris i don't like chris Ugh. can we say it right now yeah go for it <laughs> The string of unlikable protagonists continues. Yeah. <laughs> but JC, though, man, JC's great. <laughs> Make him the protagonist. Yes. Yeah. And he uh, he makes the play on Chris's behalf, which I find really weird. Honestly, when JC starts taking charge and giving Chris, like, decent advice, I started getting really, like, Dave and Stoney vibes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I didn't think about that, but you you nailed it. That's exactly what this is. It's like we did we did that movie so recently, and I'm like, this is the exact same demographic. <laughs> but uh yeah, JC goes back to Chris after talking with Cynthia, and Chris is like, Well, does she have a boyfriend? Which we know that she does, but he does not know. And JC being the good friend, being like, Yeah, uh, she didn't really say. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, being a good friend to set him up for future disappointment. <laughs> oh, at least make him make the move. To but she's like, you know, what? he's like, I think I'm in love. He's like, yeah, you know what you have to do, though, for that to go anywhere. He's like, join the fraternity. He's like, well, yeah, talk to her. Yeah. <laughs> Probably have to talk to her. How about the more probable situation to start? You know, yeah. one step forward. And then Chris just blatantly makes fun of him, telling him he doesn't understand how things work. Really? You don't understand how things work, JC? I clearly do, because I fell in love with a woman I saw across the, the, the street one time. <laughs> and had to get you to go talk to her for me. And I couldn't even talk to her after that. <laughs> <laughs> Your hero, everybody. <laughs> what do they do after that? They try and pledge the betas. All of whom look like they're in their 30s. <laughs> because they go with Chris's stupid idea. Not JC's, just go talk to her. <laughs> and I'm so glad later in the movie they referenced this. He's like, I'm always setting you up for you to do your own thing. And you always pick the wrong path. But I'm always there with you because I'm your friend. Oh. Um, during the, uh, the interview process... Chris out of nowhere just says, we don't have to have sex with a farm animal, do we? I and already hate Chris. And everybody is kind of off-put by that. Like, no. <laughs> Except for, uh, is it Brad? Yeah. Who's like, ah, that's, a good, that's a good option. It's interesting, maybe. But no, even we're not that messed up. <laughs> <laughs> in that In that exact moment, what really should have happened is Brad's like, all right, interview yeah. over. We don't want you in our fraternity if that's where your mind goes. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, like we, we do find out that, of course, they're never actually going to be accepted. They're not told that. But after they leave with their mission, 
um yeah brad's like yeah we'll, we'll, they'll never be our brothers and then it's revealed that cynthia is brad's girlfriend holy initiation mission go find a corpse and throw it on the front lawn of another fraternity uh sorority oh sorry my apologies that's <laughs> That's Much the scene better. where she's like, you threw it on the wrong sorority lawn. It was supposed to be this instead of this. And Chris like, no, it's all Greek to me. <laughs> it's a funny line. All right. Uh, so, yeah, speaking of the mission, uh, we cut to a scientist who's locked out of the lab, forgetting his code, all but one digit. Okay. Uh, the boys sneak in, and that's where they discover the uh, cryogenically frozen corpse of Johnny. You would turn around at that point, right? I wouldn't have even gone in to begin with. I mean, I've, I've snuck into labs before. Yeah, have you snuck into them to steal a corpse to throw onto a sorority? No, I did accidentally stumble upon the Aquatron at Dalhousie, though. Yeah, I, oh, fine. Accidentally. <laughs> we got out of there pretty quick. Um, <laughs> Again, they, accidentally. They as far as to open the tank. Yeah, this part i'm like what is wrong with jc you see what's going on here chris is like well he's pretty cowardly in the first place but he's like oh maybe we should get out of here and i'm like i'm with you man yeah <laughs> if yeah. i break in first of all if i break into a lab with the intent to steal a corpse to throw onto a sorority which let's hope i never find myself <laughs> at that crossroads of life and i see like this cryogenic chamber with one like body in it. I mean, like, mm, don't think this is the morgue. Mm, maybe I should rethink my life choices. Well, there are more, more questions than that. Like, why is this on campus? Uh, that... Why is there no security? <laughs> if Johnny's in stasis, why did JC have to turn the system on? He, he turned it on so he could turn it off. I think maybe he's just like initiating the control panel or something like that. Okay. I'm sure. It's got like power running to it at all times, but that makes you think, was there an alien attack back in the fifties? Because how would they know to cryogenically freeze this body? Oh, I have no idea. I didn't even think to ask that question. Right. It's not like, Oh, okay. He was going to investigate this meteor. We better cryogenically freeze him. Why? And it wouldn't make sense, too, if it had happened before, because it'd be like, Let, don't keep this on campus, please. <laughs> well, it's, it's like this current situation. If that actually happened before, they wouldn't be trying to freeze it. They would just be trying to destroy it. Yeah. Which leads me to believe this is just the trope of your classic B science fiction film. Once you start thinking realistically, it just doesn't work. Yeah. I think they're very viable questions, but okay. They get the body out of the tank, uh, and it reaches out and grabs JC's wrist. And the two just drop the body and run the hell out of there, uh, which we find out later on, uh, as screaming as if they were banshees. <laughs> that body thawed out pretty quickly. Very quickly. <laughs> like, super quick. But as they're running out, the, uh, the scientist finally retrieved his uh, code for the door and uh, they just run past him. So really weird scenario agreed way, way beyond a prank. Um, decent scene though. I liked it. Um, the boys run back to the dorm. I don't know. Like I'm assuming 86, you're, you're not on any security camera, but I probably would have gone to security. Like, you got some guy who we thought was dead who's not dead. Uh, you might want to check in on this. But I don't know. At the same time, what would you do? I wouldn't be in that situation. Okay, say you were, obviously. Man, if you were a character in this movie, this movie would have been over a long time ago. Yeah, well, I wouldn't. I mean, I would have saved a lot of lives. Yeah, right. Because <laughs> I wouldn't have set loose an alien entity. <laughs> I mean, it's quite the claim, though. Um, I love how if you boil it down to it, the whole reason that an alien entity gets spread out and kills multiple people is because Chris wanted to get laid. I'd say it's more so because Chris wouldn't talk to a girl. 
Uh, let's be honest, man. You know what he wanted. Okay. He's drawing. He's trying to join a fraternity. It's very narrow minded of you. All right, man. Okay. I but, guess from across the street, he must have fallen in love with her glowing personality. Yep. You're so cynical, dude. Jesus Christ. <laughs> I'm not being cynical. I'm literally just telling that this is why this entire thing happens. Okay. That's fine. Even though it's never referenced again in the movie, if that's your idea of his uh, intention. Okay. Um, but back at the dorm is the first sign of JC being fed up with Chris. Um, it does make perfect sense too. Uh, we get an excellent monologue from JC describing things that I had mentioned before about how he's always out there putting himself on the line for his friend who then never picks up the slack and always just destroys any forward motion they have. Thanks a lot, Dave. I mean, Chris. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm in at this point with JC's character. Like, yeah, he's super goofy and ridiculous a lot of the time. And then you get this realistic moment where it just centers him as a solidly written character and very well acted. It's at that moment that you realize that the character is not just weird or awkward or whatever you want to describe. He's just himself and he's and he, comfortable in yeah, his own skin. Exactly. As stated, he's just a centered character. He's great. The character that I have some questions about we're introduced to next, though. And that is the older detective Ray Cameron in his uh, weird beach dream zombie axe nightmare. Pretty cool dream sequence. Gotta be honest with you. You think? I think so. With like the dream, the dream or the nightmare? The, well, I kind of clump them together. Okay. Right? I mean, obviously, this it's meant to swerve you, right? Yeah. But... When they, like, especially the imagery of that, like, I guess you could call it zombie. I don't know. Like, are they zombies? Is that yeah, right? Yeah, I, I call them zombies. Okay. Of the zombie, is <laughs> zombie just ascending out of the water? Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, it was pretty good. I mean, it's an easy trick to do. No, um, I, it doesn't have to be complex. It's just, it was done in a good spot. I'm nice just... conveyance of emotion. Definitely mm -hmm. swerves the dream substantially i just i think it was well placed i'm just confused why he's wearing a white suit sitting in the sand well you know white doesn't attract the sun as much just shut up and move on oh i have to shut up and move on <laughs> jesus oh i'm such well, a jerk he gets a call from the uh, station about the break-in on campus um answering the phone with thrill me it's the first... 80s and their presumed catchphrases that are going to catch on. It's like, no, no, this one ain't working, guys. <laughs> yeah. Also, like, I have to mention the uh, the trauma he would have had to go through being the cop to find his ex being murdered in the car mm -hmm. after telling them to leave where they were, where they would have been safer. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I mean, he definitely went through some trauma. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then while he's at the lab, he is furious, absolutely furious at police ineptitude, which is a, a regular thing throughout the movie too. I, I'm not, I'm not blaming him for it, man. <laughs> yeah. He's like, there's two of you. We had to go to the washroom at the same time. You couldn't just take turns. The, the corpse just got up and walked away, but you guys were just, Oh, we had to go take a tinkle. And he even says to the one guy, I think the Sergeant, is it? Or detective detective, uh, Sergeant, uh, whatever. He's like, this better be good. You woke me from a really good dream. <laughs> <laughs> Did he? <laughs> it's like, who, was it, who took a statement? Uh, they just kind of look at each other. It's like, oh, God damn it. He's like, look, <laughs> corpses that have been dead for 27 years do not get up and go for a walk by themselves. Cut to the corpse walking down the street by itself. Um, what? <laughs> This conversation is almost like you and me talking about movies. You're just yeah. like, damn it, Sandro. <laughs> what do you think of uh, the Bradster? I do not like the He's the Chad of this movie. Exactly. He's supposed to be, though, and I think he fits perfectly as that role. I love how, like, at this point, I'm just referencing other reviews we did for character. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You actually didn't watch this movie at all. 
I, you're just waiting for me to say something. You're like, oh, yeah, like in uh, Monster Squad. Or uh, remember in Encino Man with Dave and Stoney? Well, I mean, I think it's pretty clear that, like, in Tucker and Dale, Chad was maybe our most hated character. Yeah. So I, I think, think he that's still fair. is. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm not handing the torch to anybody else at this point. All right. No, Brad drops <laughs> Cynthia off at the sorority house as Zombie Johnny approaches. Um, and this, like, there's this one part where a sorority sister says she's do- storing something. I'm like, there's no way that's just a, <laughs> that's just a statement to throw away and never reference again. That's to store <laughs> jars of brains in the basement. Don't those require, you know, like the right facilities for storage and like, yeah, just, temperature? Yeah, we uh, we, we got a deep freeze. Just chuck it in there. Yeah, and we find out later that they're just in a corner. Yep. <laughs> just put them in the corner of the basement. It's only for the weekend. Yeah, I mean, we got to dissect, dissect them later. So it's not like the school would have anywhere where they would keep that kind of thing. Yeah, it's also longer than the weekend, because if that's a Friday, we already see them in class a few times after that. But Zombie Johnny scares Cynthia at her window. Uh, his forehead opens up and slugs fall out. Um and I just pour onto the ground and scurry toward the basement. Gee, I wonder what's in the basement. <laughs> um, that horrifying scene, though, of the forehead just opening right in front of her. Yeah. And I, I do have a problem with this, too, because she is not on the first floor. She opens one window when she sa- thinks she hears something and looks down. Nothing there. And the second window she checks has a balcony, like fire escape kind of situation. Um, we don't really see the zombies do anything along the lines of climbing a ladder. So I did have a problem with that, but the, like the, uh, the makeup of zombie Johnny here is amazing. See, I thought this was going to ultimately be some sort of throwback to like the zombies have passive, like, like recollection to things that their hosts used to do Mm -hmm. because in the fifties scenario, we do see him. Like Johnny using like you know pebbles tossed at the pebbles. window, yeah, to get um, forget the Pam Pam's Pam. Uh, attention, but they never go back to that. I would have liked it if okay, yeah, okay, he's doing this out of habit, right? Like the yeah. zombie doesn't know why he's doing it; it's just something that was ingrained in his host. Yeah, um, and do little homages like that throughout, but no. And honestly, I thought that's what drew um, Cynthia's attention to that window was the sound of pebbles. Am I wrong? That's what I heard. Yeah. And that's why which, I thought that we were going to go back to this, like I said, residual memory thing. Which means this slow moving slug zombie threw pebbles at the window and before she could get to it to look, booked it around the corner and climbed a ladder up onto the fire escape. That, that's horror movie 101, man. Yeah. As soon as the creature, monster, villain, whatever it is, is off camera, they move at 300 times the speed. <laughs> Uh, the police arrive at the sorority house next and examine the body. Um, I really like the scene here where Cameron discovers the um, house mother's cottage and has a mini flashback, but it doesn't specify what the flashback insinuates. There is a question I have about the scene too. What is up with Cameron's car? I didn't even pay attention to his car. I don't know. It is so outdated, complete with the removable rooftop light and the uh like the crank siren and i have a theory which i'll mention later on too but i feel like yeah he's grown physically but mentally he's still in that 1950s police persona that's possible and i think that's why he acts the way he does no anyway. nonsense yeah by the book um the boys are confronted by the betas and Brad solidifies himself as an asshole here as he kicks out one of JC's crutches. Uh, Cynthia then, I thought, broke up with him, but apparently not, and just gave him the finger. And then the boys are taken down to the police station. We've already learned that even in the 50s, you don't officially break up with someone. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> just good gotta point. Piece, they got to piece it together later on. <laughs> yeah. But there, there is a great line from JC here, which is why Brad kicks the crutch out. Do you remember what that would have been? No. Oh, he says, why don't you get off our backs and go practice goose stepping or something? 
I was like, holy crap, Nazi joke. All right. All right, JC. <laughs> Um, Cameron questions the boys about the missing body. Um, the janitor is there as a witness. Um, they eventually come clean as to what they were doing and then blame the betas for it. Um, the janitor, absolutely hilarious with minimal dialogue. <laughs> this guy is so fucking funny. <clears throat> he has one line. <laughs> Screaming like <Two> banshees. <laughs> And then another great line from JC, though, where he's like, I personally would rather have my brains invaded by creatures from space than pledge a fraternity. Well, guess what, buddy? <laughs> so self-referential. It's great. Uh, Decker did a great job. Um, at the morgue, the dead coroner reanimates and walks away and kills the janitor, unfortunately. Coroner? Yeah. Oh, right, right, right. right or not right. the coroner. Sorry. Uh, it would have been the scientist. Yes, that's what yes, I thought. The dead but... scientist reanimates while the coroner is uh, busy. There's a lot of people just not paying attention in this movie. And not that's how even things, a little bit. That's yeah. how things kind of go to hell. Um, I didn't notice this scene before until my second uh, viewing this week, but uh, we see a, a lone slug heading towards the house mother's cottage. Uh, I, up, I uh, did notice that. Um, but we're, mean... not, we're not supposed to know what that would even imply at this point. Not yet, no. Uh, Cynthia gets a call from Brad in a throwaway scene, except for we get to see a sorority sister's zombie cat return. Zombie cat looked pretty good. It was all right. Yeah, for a relatively low budget movie, I thought it was decent. It was passable. I would have just accepted it. Yeah. Uh, Cameron reviews some old crime photos from his ex's murder. He gets a call about the scientist's body and then... Uh, more slugs but i don't think he'd be allowed to take those photos i really don't i sat and thought about it for a minute like that eh, it's a definite conflict of interest and would not be allowed access to these whatsoever but I mean, maybe that's me <clears throat> thinking too much about this he has his own particular negotiation tactics my friend he definitely does <laughs> um but he he is probably the deepest character Oh, for sure. Uh, not willing to let things go, still being haunted by things 27 years later. Um, I mean, with reason, is pretty gruesome. I mean, he watched, or not watched, but like Stumbled found on. his, he thought, girlfriend, fresh corpse after he just saw her with another man. Yeah. He wasn't having a good night. Well, it was also that... Uh, I think uh, I think it happened. It might happen later in a flashback. But one of the uh, one of the other officers at the murder scene in '59 was saying that um, if they had to use a different stretcher for every piece, they'd be there for hours. Yeah, because she was like, just completely Jesus. mutilated by the axe murderer. Anyway, the boys are in the room studying. I have quotes around studying. Uh, JC is not stunning. No, he's just drumming. <laughs> he's just Put drumming pencils. along, having a blast of a time. Uh, Cynthia shows up and asks them to go for a walk. How does she know where they live? I don't know. Oh, she looks it up in the directory, I think she says. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the Throw student away. directory. I forgot about that. Um, while on the walk, JC leaves to give them time together. Cynthia tells Chris about the slugs. And she's taking the whole zombie Johnny thing rather well. Yeah. I'm also wondering why she's talking to these two. Because her knowledge of them thus far is that Brad accused them of throwing the corpse on the lawn. It was revealed that it was Brad. And then she was like, I guess I can trust these guys. Yeah. I've meant, I've, I've talked to this JC character for Once. a minute. Yeah. And uh, Chris just kind of stared at me. Which oh, I, I do have to go back to the point, too, where JC's talking to Cynthia. And... Uh, saying that he's there on behalf of his friend Chris and like points over at Chris who then panics and he has cup in hand and just turns away quickly and slams it into the guy behind him. You know what I would have rather seen? What's that? You know what I'm going to say, right? No. <laughs> hey! <laughs> <laughs> no. No, you don't sully Gary Busey on this show. I was, it would have been so much better. I'm, I'm here for my friend over there. <laughs> Yeah, it actually just is a shot of Gary Busey across the way. Be like, hey! And then, and then it just pans over a little bit more and it's Chris. 
Um, before JC leaves, though, like Chris throws his arm around the distraught woman, and the boys <laughs> silently celebrate behind her, like Cynthia's kryptonite is being mocked when she presents genuine concern. <laughs> like we got this. This is our protagonist, everyone. Yeah. She's in a moment of weakness. Strike. <laughs> yeah. Like, and I, this, I mean, like, this is 80s through and through, man. You see this in so many 80s movies, but like, Jesus, come on. Um, Moving on, we see the janitor is now a zombie. Definitely not screaming <laughs> like a banshee. Uh, <laughs> My favorite, like a banshee, <laughs> was before he got killed. Oh, he's, he's just, just walking, walking down. <laughs> he's walking down the hallway by himself, pushing his like janitor cart. And he's still just chuckling to himself. And at this point, he's got nobody to repeat it to. It's yeah. been plenty of time since. And he's still like, <laughs> like a bitch. <laughs> Best one. It's, it's weird to have a running joke stated that many times in such a short time period and it still be fucking hilarious oh every time i saw him before that i was even hoping like zombie janitor would somehow say it that would have been amazing <laughs> because then you play up the residual memory thing again right yeah and if he just like oh here's zombie janitor and he said like a banshee <laughs> i would have lost it at that moment i probably would have just bowed out and been like you win movie you win <laughs> favorite character mr minor <laughs> No, unfortunately not. Spoilers. Yeah. Because I didn't get zombie <laughs> zombie janitor saying like a banshee, he does not win. Uh, Chris and Cynthia head back toward the sorority house. Um, This is probably the most disturbing scene for me, um, where JC is attacked by slugs in the bathroom. Yeah. Um, It worked, man. Like, I, did, I was very uneasy i didn't like what i was seeing and that was the point of the scene um, it was probably my um low point of the movie because i really didn't want to see jc die at least not yet yeah no me neither and it's um, like he just like essentially came up with an excuse to bow out and further help his friend yeah like and this is his reward <sighs> yeah well he's in the stall and sees one of the slugs scurry by and they make weird little squeaky noises great great sound for this um and he he actually kills one with a book of matches he burns it and it dies a match he had one match left oh but he lights the match book itself on fire. exactly right, right right um i didn't remember where the slugs came from originally until they cut and you saw that they had burst out of the janitor's head and the Janitor's yeah. body is laying on the they floor. They showed him walking into the bathroom after when it was yeah. kind of cutting back and forth. JC um, was sitting on the toilet writing on the bathroom stall wall, and you saw the janitor walking towards the door. Cut, cut, yeah. and now the janitor's inside type thing. So Also, the the uh, graffiti in the stall is interesting. Striper rules. That's a weird one. Have you ever listened to Striper? No. It's a Christian hair metal band. No. Biggest uh, hit is, I think, To Hell with the Devil. Um, but there's also another one that's just go monster squad. So that is a nice nod. Um, of course you're noticing what's written on the bathroom stall wall. Of course. Yeah. Okay. Um, I felt so bad for JC though. Like after he kills that one slug and then like pushes the stall door open and like leans forward and he's left his crutches in the stall. And he's just dragging himself across the floor, trying to get away. This didn't belong in this movie. It was it's too way serious. too serious. And yeah. like, you're rooting for the guy, but you're like, this isn't going to work out. And it's... Yeah, he's the one character you want to see succeed. Well, him and maybe Detective Cameron. Um, Cynthia asks Chris to go to the dance. Why? At... Wait, sorry, sorry. <laughs> we, we cut back to her telling him about the leeches and stuff and the zombie Johnny. Like, right after JC excuses himself, mm -hmm. she says something, and I don't have it written down, but it's something along the Shame. lines of, I have to tell you something, and if you don't believe me, I don't know who will. And even in that moment, I'm like, why do you think he will? <laughs> yeah, probably you, anybody, really. You have no reason at this point to to rely on the guy who's trying to make a pass at you at a vulnerable moment, that he's the only one... In the entire world that will believe you about a zombie. Mm -hmm. 
Sorry, that's all. I just had to get that off my chest. It pissed me off so much. No, that's fine. What I found strange was immediately after that, she goes inside and Cameron's there cornering Chris and then just <laughs> takes him to his trailer. I don't know. It's You'd think you would take him to the station. Something. Also, like, okay, this is a perfect example of how I think he's still stuck back in time mentally. Um, the constant references to little rascals keeps calling Chris Spanky. I was wondering where that came from. Well, I didn't even see what initiated. I just remember partway through the movie, I'm like, why is he calling him Spanky now? Yeah, it's a, a little rascals reference, which then Chris adds to later on. Yeah, yeah, but why is he calling Chris Spanky? I don't know. I just, just said cause. it. Just does. Yeah. Just does. Um, but yeah, there's that quote that says, zombies, exploding heads, creepy crawlies, and a date for the formal. This is classic Spanky. Is it? <laughs> I, I didn't see that, little rascals. <laughs> yeah. And like, more dark Cameron. Uh, the Cameron two, they bond point, over the lost high school sweethearts part. I'm like, uh... Okay. At no point do they give us any sort of even attempt at showing us that Cameron does things by the book. No. Um, yeah, Cameron takes it step darker, telling Chris about the axe murderer. Um, <laughs> Why and, are people just opening up to Chris? <laughs> well, <laughs> he, listen. Even he says that, too. Chris, Chris is like, so is there... Or is like, aside from wanting to confess to murder, is there anything else I should be, or anything else I should know, or something we should be doing? This guy but just no, got out of a conversation where he was told about zombies, and then a yeah. police officer drags him to who the hell knows where, and is like, yeah. I murdered a guy. But yeah, we <laughs> like, finding out that Cameron tracked the murderer down, and shot him to death, and secretly buried him in a vacant lot, is dark. Yeah. He says something too. Is uh, the way he says it is something like, "What I did could only be like constituted as revenge or something like that." Yeah. But then we uh, we find out that <clears throat> vacant lot is no longer vacant, and it is where the house mother's cottage is, uh, the house mother for the uh, sorority house. So. Oh, but wait, that's where the slug went. Exactly. Oh. But yeah, I also have a note saying this is a very <laughs> weird moment of honesty, and why the hell would he tell Chris? <laughs> what? <laughs> but after that reveal, we do go directly to the house mother's um, cottage, um, where she's watching Plan Nine from outer space. So it's a fun reference. Good nod to the uh, genre itself. Uh, did you expect a zombie axe murderer or just another zombie? Uh, I didn't really expect anything. Yeah, it. I don't know. It's a great reveal too. Just like the scratching and then the hacking. And then this zombie just bursts through the floor and axes the house mother in the face. Question. Okay. Why bury the corpse with the ax? <laughs> well, I'm probably to get rid of the evidence. I'm sure in that moment, he's just like, well, if somebody finds the ax now as well, but I don't remember at any point in the movie them saying that they never caught the murderer. Mm, I don't know. Yeah. It's just a weird one. It's not really important. It just kind of seems like something they would have touched on. But um, Cameron gets the call and grabs his shotgun. And where's the shotgun? Directly under his bed on the floor in plain sight. Yeah, like, seems about right. That's where you would hide something. Sure. The bed's probably two feet off the ground, off the floor. It's just laying there, not hidden at all. And that, again, makes me think, yeah, this is expected of a hardened detective in the 50s. Um, at the murder scene, uh, the axe zombie attacks the police car, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, and then we get the, uh, the same quote again from another officer about the... Uh, the house mother. If we like banshees. Different pressure for every piece, we'd be here all night. Oh, so not like banshees. Not like banshees. Sorry, buddy. <clears throat> um, what did you think about uh, Cameron chasing down the zombie and uh, killing it? Um, it was a little much 
in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, the it only, makes sense, but heavy-handed, right? Very heavy-handed. The one thing that I did like, though, and is probably pretty irrelevant to the greater plot, is just when he says, like, I already killed you once. Yeah. That paired with the fact that the zombie grins at him, like that acknowledgement between the two. Again, would be awesome. great if we were running with the residual memories thing. Yeah. Because the... the but the, it's just an awesome scene. Yeah. It just doesn't fit this movie, much like the scene in the bathroom, or in my opinion, even the entire 50s scene. There is residual memory, though. There has to be. Because... It, it's just like they just didn't have it in them to go like full bore with it. Yeah. Because it, it takes a while before... Well, we'll get to Brad and Cynthia... But, um, yeah, uh, there's finally acknowledgement of JC missing on campus. Uh, then a montage of getting ready for the dance. Um, and I guess this montage has nudity because of the 80s. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's exactly what yeah. it is. A hundred percent. Then the movie goes even darker when oh. Chris goes back to the uh, dorm uh, and finds the recording from JC. Did that move you at all? because mm. it's him mm. recording what's happening after having been infected it's hard to say I mean at the time it would definitely piqued my curiosity um, but I was very confused because there's a lot of times where as soon as they're infected they kind of lose kind of control over those different functions we and don't this, see that though <sighs> Yes, I don't I think, know. I think you just assumed that's what happens because it always <clears throat> cuts away when someone gets infected. Yeah, that's true. We don't like see the janitor or the young doctor as soon nope. as they're infected. Or Johnny. I guess it's just the way the movie was cut. It made it feel like, oh, okay, the zombie or the janitor gets attacked. And then like very quickly we cut back to it later where, oh, he's walking as a zombie again, right? I yeah. think it was just maybe the way the movie was done made it feel like it was like immediate. Yeah, I agree. I think this is one clear instance where the editing directly worked against the the film. Yeah. Um but just JC talking about how the slugs work, how it got in through his mouth, how he can feel it in his brain, um how he's going to take him or how to kill them with fire. Um, and how he's going to take himself down to the uh, the boiler room. Uh, but there's that one line that, like, he's so beside himself saying, like, he walked all by himself. It's like amazement and sadness and knowing that he's going to die. Like, it was intense, man. Maybe I looked into it too much, but that one line killed me. And yeah, so Chris heads down to the boiler room and finds JC, but it's already too late. See, um, that got me a lot more than, and again, I think maybe I was just too preoccupied with my confusion on how quickly these things incubate. Mm -hmm. But when Chris went down there, it's like, you didn't even have to say anything and just seeing like kind of, it was almost even like cut to like, just low, like JC's lower body kind yeah. of coming out from behind the boiler i was like ah oh, no yeah and just like seeing him face down but the one thing that confused me there is all of the slugs that came out of him were dead um they all maybe just it doesn't burned into fire. the floor maybe it just needs to be really really hot i don't know that could be i mean he was right next to the boiler but yeah it was weird um pretty intense scene probably one of the better scenes really mm-hmm well, time for the dance. The bait is load onto the bus and uh, uh, Brad, I believe, then gets infected by the slug dog. Is it Brad? Is it Brad? I didn't think so. I thought it was just one of the fraternity guys, but I could be wrong. Okay, that could be it. Um, I just have Chris or I had Chris in my notes. I'm like, that's not true. No. <laughs> I'm like, it must be Brad. Um, I, I almost... Yeah, might have even been like the unibrow fraternity guy that was talking Steve? to. Uh, I, don't, I don't remember her yeah. name. 
talking to um, Cynthia when JC first talked to her at the party in the beginning, but I really don't know if it was meant to be anybody specific, just one of the, the fraternity guys. Yeah. Cause I'm, Oh, I think I know what it was. It was Brad drinking outside of the sorority house, getting pissed off, whipping the bottle into the yard and turning around and the dog runs up and shoots a slug into his mouth. That's what it was. Okay. Right. Well, the movie gets even darker. <laughs> That's not As, possible. Oh, yes, it is. Cameron's getting drunk at his place again. Um, Chris shows up and tells him about JC and what the slugs are and what they have to do to kill them. And again, Cameron arms up and they leave. But before they leave, because the whole time this is happening, the camera's slowly zooming in on the oven, the gas oven which is turned on with the door open because Cameron was going to kill himself. Foreshadowing? Uh, not really. I don't think so. Um, I think this is just how much he has given up. <clears throat> but, like that. Okay. This one part, I think is, is too dark for this movie. Potentially not foreshadowing, but I would argue that his final act in the movie would have seemed very unlike him if we didn't get this hint. I disagree. It's two different, two different like opposites here. This scene and then the end scene. They no. Uh, I find this to be the weird break in his character. Um, but anyway, yeah. I mean, that's that's something we could all like anybody listening. Uh, get in touch with us because this is a conversation we could have like this character jump from this point to the end. Um, but then we get the zombie dog running the bus off the road, which, yeah, yeah I mean, more than anything, just a plot device. Yeah, this got to infect the rest of the uh, fraternity guys, got to increase that body count. And then we get to what's probably your favorite part of the movie, the police armory, where uh, Cameron and Chris go to get a flamethrower. I mean, flamethrower makes sense. Who's working the armory? Uh, some police officer. Yes. Um, Definitely a person we've never talked about before on this show. Mm-hmm. I agree. How good is it to see Dick Miller on screen again? I'm I'm happy with it every time it happens. Yeah. It, it, he's never bad. <clears throat> he's just never bad. He I, I just found it. Smile. I just found it a little weird because of the name of the character. Walter Paisley. Yes. And after seeing that, and I mentioned it to you, I went and looked. Yep, me too. And six times he played a character named Walter Paisley. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look on, say, for example, IMDb at this movie, the character is just listed as Walt. But if you look at his name tag, yeah, it says W. W. Paisley. Paisley. And that's like when you go into the Dick Miller profile, there's a bunch of instances where it's that combination of Walter Paisley six times. That's pretty. Yeah. I, I didn't know what happened there. <laughs> I actually that... found a, uh, a page that has the biography of Walter Paisley. Really? And all of his appearances. Yeah. Yeah. Because it was what? A Bucket of Blood, Hollywood Boulevard, uh, The Howling, the third segment of Twilight Zone, the movie. Uh, chopping mall uh and the remake of shake rattle and rock okay yeah of which i've only seen like three counting this one or four counting this one um i did find it weird they actually had a flamethrower though of course they did it's the 80s <clears throat> i guess but i i guess i really don't know much about police armories so who knows I'm pretty sure it's standard issue. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're walking your first beat? <laughs> Make sure you take the flamethrower. Yeah. Um, the reaction of uh, Dick asking for the requisition? <laughs> uh, here's a shotgun to the face. <laughs> there could be a little problem. Yeah. Uh, and, and I like how as Dick is kind of hesitantly about to ask for the requisition, um... Jesus, how did I just forget his name? Cameron? Uh, yes. Cameron is like literally loading the shell in front of him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you could tell like, like 
Dick Miller's hesitation is like, yeah, I don't know if he should be loading that right now. This is going to go sideways. <laughs> uh, I love Tom Atkins. Pairing Tom Atkins and Dick Miller was brilliant. Seriously, give me that buddy cop movie. Oh my God, yes. That would be amazing. Like uh, a Dick Miller, Tom Atkins, lethal weapon scenario. Yeah. The, uh, the zombie dog enters the bus. It was Brad who got turned because I have zombie Brad knocks on the sorority house door and then the dog infects the beta corpses on the bus. Um, whereas zombie Johnny tried to break in through the window, he still did the little pebble throwing thing and Brad knows enough to knock on the door. So I think there is some residual memory like we were talking about before, but the girl who answers the door doesn't even notice that he's a zombie. No, she's pissed. Is anybody going to answer the door? <laughs> and then she opens the door and she's like, Cynthia. <laughs> and Brad looks great as a zombie, man. <laughs> it's like, this isn't subtle. <laughs> no, it's like a completely different color. And his eyes are like opaque blue. Um, <laughs> he might He might as well have been a legit zombie with a fresh brain in his mouth that he's chomping on. And oh, she still would never have noticed. Have noticed. Uh, no. Cynthia, I think he got into the basement stash. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the beta zombies altogether, like coming out of the bus, look fantastic. Um, they did spend a fair amount on special effects seeing this. They would have to. Again, makes me wonder about the whole butt alien thing, but whatever. <laughs> Just um, don't put it in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> and this is, again, the residual memory thing, I believe. Because there's the scene of Cynthia and Brad... And she takes him by the hand without looking at him. And they walk to the front steps and sit down. And he's holding off from infecting her this whole time until he like eventually tries to. But it's almost like that would have been the first thing he would have done when the girl opened the door, not just stand there. Um, but Cameron and Chris arrive on scene. Um, Cameron with a shotgun and Chris with the flamethrower. And it seems like an interesting way of taking out the slugs. By shooting Brad in the face and then lighting his head on fire. Well, you got to shoot him so that the slugs are exposed, you see. I guess so, yeah. Great uh, great effects again, though. Looks awesome. <laughs> like, like, Chris doesn't even recognize what's going on initially. It's only no. a few, like, few minutes later, he's like, oh, I'm sorry, I just <laughs> killed your boyfriend in front of you. <laughs> At one point, just hands him the shotgun and say, here, hold this, it'll make you feel better. Yes. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. This just killed your boyfriend. Hold on to it. <laughs> um, the betas arrive. Um, Cameron fights inside of the sorority house. Chris and Cynthia fight outside, but end up being forced to hide in a shed. Uh, and we get one of my favorite zombie kills in the movie here, where Chris uses a lawnmower to run over zombie Steve's head. This is not a good plan. No, Their method it's of just attack. Gonna expose the, the the slugs more. Exactly. I mean, the lawnmower sure would chop them up, but like Cameron inside the house, he just has a handgun. Like all all he'll be doing is setting the slugs free in the house. Yep. Um, there's the reveal that the slugs have been going to that house specifically because of the brains in the basement, which I find strange because when we see it, there aren't that many brains that she puts down there. No. But how um, many brains are just sitting exposed like that? That's a good point. You think they would have all been like infected by now, though? It's been a while, and they could just infect the people wandering about. Like, I mean, no how long ago, movie wise, did we see them crawling towards the basement in the very first? Like, yeah, it's been a few days at least. Yep. Um, Chris and Cynthia head downstairs and find Cameron. Uh, and I think this is brilliant. He's soaking the place with gasoline and he's got duct tape over his mouth so he won't get infected. Makes sense. I mean, he yeah. doesn't want to get infected. Yeah, ready to burn the place down. Um, what did gross me out was when they point the light to the writhing mass of slugs in the corner. Yeah. Uh, looked great, but gross as fuck. Well, um, they all incubated inside of the brains. Yeah. Too many slugs for how many brains there are, though. Um, of course, the kids escape. And Cameron blows up the house. Uh, and a super quick resolution. Like Cynthia and Chris kiss as the fire department and police arrive. But then we see that zombie Cameron 
wanders out of the fire, collapses, his head explodes, and slugs flee out of it directly into a neighboring cemetery. Again, Chris's fault. Yep. Because he had to take the duct tape off to tell him to get out of there. Yeah. And a spotlight turns on overhead, scanning the graveyard, because the aliens have arrived looking for their experiment. The end. Not a fan of that final scene. No. I like the theatrical ending a lot more. Um, Did you look that one up? No, I didn't, actually. I didn't know there was a difference between the two, so I just watched the director's cut that we had and yeah. called it now the, um The ending is the main difference between the two. Uh, the original ending yeah. had uh, after um, like Cameron dies, and that's the end. Heroic act, saving everybody. Um, Chris and Cynthia are outside, and they have their kiss, as they do in the director's cut. But after that, the uh, zombie dog runs up, and Cynthia bends over to like pat it, and it infects her. Yeah, I would have liked that better. Yeah, it is a better ending for sure. Yeah, uh, I mean, anything to stay away from like the aliens currently in outer space aspect mm-hmm. did not yeah, need get, to be there. Yeah, and get rid really, of the aliens altogether. Both endings can sequel bait. Uh, just one feels a lot better. <laughs> one also implies that there are going to be aliens in the sequel. I don't want that. <laughs> well that um, was that was night of the creeps yeah i i still really enjoy this movie i know we didn't talk too favorably about it but um i don't think it needed any more money to do anything bigger i feel like a five million dollar budget is perfect for this um would you have changed any of the effects other than removing aliens no no yeah. if you remove the aliens and In my opinion, then the dog becomes the worst and not to say bad, but just the worst effect in the movie. Mm -hmm. I don't think, especially for like 1986, anybody's going to complain about the the effects. Makeup was fantastic. Practicals outside of the aliens were fairly well done. Little bit of blemishes in the dog. But again, if that's the worst of them, very forgivable. I think that in this situation, they actually just hurt it by putting more in it that didn't need to be there. I agree completely. Um, Yeah, and the shitty thing is, like, without the alien ending, you don't need the alien beginning. So it would just save the money on that set, on those costumes, if you want to call them costumes. Yeah, go go with the theatrical ending and just show the aliens crash landing on Earth via canister, uh, asteroid, anything. Yeah. And you have a much cleaner, no poor special effects to bring that aspect down movie is just cleaner it's more concise and you don't need an explanation on how they got there they're just nope. there and that's what slither does and does so well uh but yeah five million dollar budget care to uh guess how much this movie made 1986 theatrical release uh 13 uh 591,000 oof that went in the wrong direction the bomb massive massive bomb and I don't know why. It must have been the marketing or something. Because the re- the reviews are quite good, actually. Yeah? What are those reviews, Ben? Um, IMDb. I, from the way you talk of this movie, I think you agree with the IMDb rating of uh, 6.7 out of 10. Maybe. O- oddly enough, uh, the highest score comes from the, uh, the critics, the Rotten Tomatoes, have it at uh, 75% and the audience score at 70 Mm, yeah, I think those are both pretty high. Yeah, what would you what would you point this at? I don't think it's that time yet, is it? Mm, okay, make you stew on it for a little <laughs> bit. Um, one thing I did want to bring up was um, the uh, the names of the characters. Did you look at any of that trivia? No, no, I didn't. Um, there are so many horror references in character names alone. Okay. Uh, our lead is Chris Romero, George Romero. Um, JC is JC Hooper, James Carpenter Hooper. You got John Carpenter and Toby Hooper, directors. Um, we got uh, Ray Cameron, it's, uh, James Cameron, Cynthia Cronenberg, David Cronenberg, uh, Detective Landis for uh, John Landis and Sergeant Raimi for Sam Raimi. 
Um, we've got Officer Bava, Mario Bava, uh, director, as well as Officer Craven, Wes Craven. Um, and one fun thing is that uh, two of the beta zombies were um, Howard Berger and Robert Kurtzman, who are the K and B in K and B effects that do all of the Walking Dead zombies and everything. Um, yeah, so there's a, a, just a lot of fun references. Like Fred Decker wrote the script and directed, he insisted he directed his own script because of little things like this. Like it's, it is a love letter for sure to um, the horror uh, sci fi with a uh, peppered comedy. Hmm. Well, he knew what he was doing, I guess. Yeah. All right, should we get to the awards then? Yep. All right, so we have adjusted our first two awards a little bit, um, just to make them a little bit less restrictive and let us go uh, kind of more in whatever direction we want with it. So the first award is being redubbed as our least favorite character. Um, so that way we can go into performance, writing, whatever reason, instead of just specifically trying to find an actor that we thought was the worst. Uh, ben, what did you have for least favorite character? Uh, Chris Romero. Oh, easily. <laughs> yeah. Aw, Dave. I mean, we actually changed these awards partway through, and I had already been considering my picks before it. And when it was just worst performance, I was torn between um, uh, uh, Jason Lively and Jill Withlow already. Mm. But as soon as we were like worst character, I'm like, it's definitely the unlikable protagonist, Chris, because yeah. he just does so many scummy, sleazebaggy things that uh, coupled with the bad performance, I don't know how you don't pick him. Yeah, agreed. Um, if we were going for like worst performance or least favorite performance, I think for me, it would have been a uh, uh, least worst or least best. Sorry. Because I, I don't think any of them were really that bad. So saying worst performance is, I don't know, kind of mean in that case. I think a lot of them were pretty bad, and I have no problem sure saying you do. it. You think uh, everything is bad? I'm just saying, uh, like Jason Lively and Jill Withlow, you dodged a worst performance because we got rid of the award. I was even thinking of giving them co-award winners for that. <laughs> if only we could do co-awards co for uh, favorite character. Uh, yeah, I think you're probably going to have a tough choice on that one. I go first, though. Yep. My favorite character, and for me, was not difficult. I can see what two you're probably debating, but for me, it was easily JC. Why is that? I mean, we kind of already talked about it. The character was entertaining, but he, he was insightful. He was comfortable in his own skin. He's the one character that at any point in the movie I actually felt concern or sympathy for. Mm-hmm. And I mean, in, and in all honesty, if I was looking at actual acting performance, I don't know if he was the best, but he wouldn't have even been considered for worst. So yeah. you combine all of that. You got one heck of a character, my friend. Yep. I, I did pick JC as well. You're but... probably debating between him <clears throat> and uh, uh, Ray Cameron, though, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think the JC character is just, it gets, I'd say they get equal screen time but he has more of a character arc and he's more supporting for the other characters in the movie. Whereas Cameron's a loner who's given up on life. Um, and that dark character doesn't really fit in the movie, um, but they made, well, Tom Atkins made him fit. So a uh, memorable character for sure. But yeah, favorite character would have to be JC Hooper. Awesome. Um, okay, so this one hasn't changed. Our favorite or most memorable line, what did you have for that? I really wanted to put thrill me, but... Uh, I'm, I'm for, glad you didn't if you didn't. I didn't. <laughs> okay, good. Um, no, it's the classic line from the trailer. Cameron and the girl at the sorority house. It's like, I've got good news and I've got bad news, girls. The good news is your dates are here. Well, what's the bad news? They're dead. Yeah, that one, I mean... It stood out for me, but it, it didn't hit home like, like maybe okay. it was supposed to be. Yeah. Well, it, it does hit home for everybody but you. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Are you still coming up with yours or something? Oh, it's my turn? Well, I just <laughs> told you mine. What the fuck are you doing? Uh, it's not like Banshees, right? So it's not screaming like Banshees. Okay. I really wanted it, but it wasn't. 
Um, surprisingly, uh, and I was even considering the line about you woke me from a really nice dream just because of the irony of it. But I went with a JC line, and it's probably also not a JC line that you're thinking of. Um, when he is essentially excusing himself to go to the bathroom, and he uh, once again tees up Chris, he says, all right, go for it, partner. I mean, she's definitely misplaced her marble collection, but go for it. And he's saying this not to them, but to himself as he's walking away. Like, like even he's just like, yeah, I'm setting you up, but I don't know why. <laughs> it yeah. must only be because I care about you so much. <laughs> That's your most memorable line? Yes. All right. All right. I'm sorry if I have a <laughs> separate opinion from the masses. What's the memorable scene? Uh, I start that, right? Yep. That's why I asked you. I don't think you need to <laughs> ask me, my friend. You know what it is. No. It's the Dick Miller scene. And there's no other scene that can even be in contention. Oh, yes, there is. No. What's with your dramatic pauses? I said my scene now. It's your turn. That's what you J did to me just now in the line. JC in the bathroom. Okay, I can see why that's up there. Yeah, because it's the most intense scene in the movie with one of the best characters. It's absolutely the most intense scene in the movie, but unfortunately for me, it feels like it's the so, most intense scene out of a movie that most, is Most things not are unfortunately for you. <laughs> it's the most intense scene of a movie that it's not in. Because it does not fit this movie. It's too good for this movie. At least with Something the Dick tells Miller. me you don't like this movie. Man, you'd be surprised. The thing about the Dick Miller scene, though, yeah. is that it has a, a level of like absurdity that actually fits in this movie. Yeah. Okay. All right. So those were our awards. <sighs> <laughs> he sounds so beaten down. Ah, you're frustrating me. Giving me a hard time picking my own awards. Yeah. Yeah. That's what you, you need just... to be. You need to be convinced. You need to back these decisions. What do I need to back? It's Dick Miller. Yeah, it's, he's pretty it's good. backed. He's pretty good. And again, my explanation as to why I didn't pick the bathroom scene, while I did love the scene, is simply because it just stood out like a sore thumb, which will probably make it memorable, mm -hmm. but it just doesn't feel right. Okay. You might not agree with it, but at least that's my reasoning. I'm giving you my reasoning. <laughs> Obviously, I don't agree with you. That's why I, I picked it. I hate you. Wow. Hey, All right. Creep well, you if a you... Breakdown. If you guys want to share your thoughts on Night of the Creeps, hit us up on social media. We are at BS Bargain Bin on Twitter, Facebook.com slash BS Bargain Bin, BS Bargain Bin on any of your podcast services. Let's get to final thoughts before you tell us what we're watching next week. Ben, yep. what did you think of this movie, Night of the Creeps? Love it. It's a fantastic film. Um, we always talk about would you recommend? Hell yeah, I would. It's a lot of fun and you can watch it with anybody. It's got science fiction, it's got horror, it's got comedy, competent acting, great writing, directing. It's just super fun. I don't know why more people don't know about it. What, what about you? What movie are you talking about? Night of the Creeps. Com it's, it came out in uh, 1986. Competent acting? That's yeah. not in this movie. Yeah, you're right. Dick Miller really dropped the ball. Uh, no, see, now you can't even do that because you love Dick Miller yourself. No, the acting is great. That's Tom a bad Atkins is trolling amazing. move. Get Tom out of here. Atkins, fantastic. As there's good performances, but not competent performances all around. Mm, disagree. I'll lose it. Going to. Yes. This is not me losing it yet. Okay. Thought you were just taking a moment to reflect about how wrong you were. Uh... That's okay. If you need, need some more time, we can edit this out. Just deep breath. Atkins. I hate you. I hate you so Lively. <laughs> Thrill me. All right. I'm done with this movie. I'm done with it. My recommendation is check it out. It's worth one watch. Unfortunately, the identity crisis of it being too many things might not interest you in a second viewing, but it's not a bad watch per se. 
No, it's a great watch. All Don't right, I'm, He's so negative. I'm done with this episode. Ben, what are we watching next week? Uh, next week, we are watching 1985's Fright Night. Among her people next door. Oh, I guess the new owner's moving in. Supposed to be very attractive. There are two guys out in the yard, and I think they're carrying a coffin. Charlie, do you want to make love or not? There was a murder last night. Charlie thinks he saw the victim in this house. I saw him carry her body out in a plastic bag. Another body of a young woman was discovered early this morning in back of the Sheridan Mall. The guy did have fangs, and a bat did fly over my head, and a second later, he stepped out of the shadows. Now, don't you see what that means? Wait, let me guess. What? I have a vampire living next door to me, and he's going to kill me if I don't protect myself. The vampire? cannot enter your house without being invited first. This is our next door neighbor, Jerry Dandridge. Hello, Charlie. Right Until then, have a good one, guys. All the best, guys.